Space fans, and welcome to the first Space Fan News of 2020. This year marks, I can't believe it, the ninth year that I started posting this new series. It all started with the winter meeting of the American Astronomical Society in 2011, and it continues to this day. In this episode, at a town hall held on the first day of the AAS meeting, NASA program managers and scientists express confidence that the James Webb Space Telescope will launch as currently scheduled in March 2021. Also, I got more feedback from my JWST reporting, <laughs> this time from the Public Affairs Office at NASA, so stick around. As I record this, the 235th meeting of the American Astronomical Society is behind us. So let's take a look at some of the stories that came out of the proceedings, one of them most notably the latest on the JWST mission. During the town hall meeting, both NASA and Northrop Grumman expressed optimism that the long overdue and way over budget space telescope will launch in March of 2021. Eric Smith, the program scientist for JWST at NASA HQ, said that the testing is going very well and 2019 saw many important milestones successfully achieved. The telescope is completely assembled and has seen its sun shield deployed once, and right now the entire spacecraft is being folded back into its launch configuration. Workers are also currently replacing two electronics units that failed during testing last year. One unit was the command telemetry processor, and it malfunctioned during environmental testing. But engineers, they had, had problems duplicating the errors that they were seeing, and so they decided to just replace the unit. The second box that failed was a traveling wave tube amplifier used in the spacecraft's communication system, and they are currently replacing that one as well. Another problem they're working on right now concerns residual pressure within the payload fairing of the rocket itself. What they're worried about is that the fairing separation could overstress the sun shield membranes. Now, tests on recent Ariane 5 launches confirmed that there is a higher residual pressure than the sun shield was designed for, so they're taking a very close look at this. And to address this problem, vents in the fairing are being redesigned and will be tested on Ariane 5 launches that are already scheduled to go up in early 2020, and they're going to see if this mitigates that, ex that extra pressure. Moving on, coming up this year, 2020 will see more important milestones in the mission. The Sun Shield will undergo another final set of deployments, as well as some vibration and acoustical testing that will simulate the launch itself. This is going to be a big deal. After that, everything will be packed up and shipped from Southern California, where it is now, to Kourou, French Guyana, where it will be prepared, finally, <laughs> for launch on an Ariane 5 rocket. Also at the town hall, Scott Willoughby, vice president and program manager for JWSD at Northrop Grumman, said that, and this is a quote, all of the work that's planned in front of us is very well understood. If everything goes as planned, the schedule is very much sufficient to get us there, unquote. And Willoughby also said, quote, 2019 was as successful of a year on this program as you could possibly have imagined in the history of it. I think that's a great foretelling of 2020, unquote. Now, Jeff Faust from Space News also reported that Greg Robinson, the JWST program director at NASA HQ, is also optimistic about staying on schedule. Quote, hopefully, by the end of the year, we'll take this baby over to Long Beach and put it on a boat and send it to Kourou. Now, all of this optimism is tempered by one concern. The schedule margin is getting tight. There are only two months of schedule reserve left in the budget. Every project has a reserve of money that they call on to pay for unforeseen events like government shutdowns, something you got to worry about these days, project delays, equipment failures, and things like that. But it appears that JWST only has about two months of that reserve left, even though we are over a year from launch time. Still, even with the tightness in the reserve, JWST managers say that because there's been lots of really good progress in 2019 and they haven't experienced any major technical issues during recent testing, that they're confident things are going to be just fine. But smaller problems like the electronics boxes I just told you about having to be replaced, they cut into that reserve. 
Now, it should be said that most missions expect to use up their reserves as the launch date approaches. And in the past, there were concerns from, say, like the Independent Review Board from last year, who warned that the mission appeared to be using up the scheduled reserve at a higher than expected rate. But mission, but mission manager said that the high rate of reserve use was to address problems that they felt were behind them now. Now, Greg Robinson cited the recent deployment of the SunShield having been almost error-free as an example that most of the big stuff is behind them now. So, it looks like everybody working on JWST has started to look towards getting ready for launch. While there may be some problems, no one expects anything major. But if there is anything major, then things could get bad and we could be looking at another delay. So, fingers crossed everyone, <laughs> we've waited a long time for this thing. Let's hope the barge doesn't sink or the spacecraft falls off because, well, that would really suck. <laughs> okay, so while I'm on the subject of JWST, I've been a little surprised at the reaction I've been getting from official JWST channels. On the one hand, <laughs> it's great that people are watching, but on the other hand, it's a little unnerving to a small guy like me. I need to be careful about what I say and how I say it because people are watching. Ah. <laughs> So, I got a call from the NASA Public Affairs Office about my last JWST video where I chided NASA for its role in the delays and cost overruns, and that was prompted by an even earlier video I made that went off on Northrop Grumman about its handling of the mission. Now, I put the links to those videos in the description box, but let me now forward to you what I was told by Felicia Chow, who is NASA's Public Affairs Officer, and Eric Smith, the aforementioned Program Scientist for JWST at NASA HQ, they wanted to correct me on a couple of issues. First off, remember that I mentioned that NG had complained that not all technology uses what usage was their choice. There were heated arguments about what hardware could be used, and some of it was mandated by NASA and overruled possible Northrop Grumman choices. Well, Eric Smith told me that it's not uncommon for NASA to recommend parts to use, but there is always a lot of discussion that goes on, and in the end, everybody agrees that something will or won't work. So, let me be clear, with every discussion, no matter how heated it becomes, at no point has anything been used in building the James Webb Space Telescope that wasn't agreed on by everyone. So, while there may have been heated discussions about what parts to use, this isn't really an unhealthy thing to do. Sometimes the contractor wins, sometimes NASA wins, but in the end there is always enough discussion that everyone has agreed to move forward. There hasn't been a time when Northrop Grumman has said that it wouldn't certify the spacecraft if we have to use a part that NASA is forcing on us. They never said that. In the end, all parties agree on what parts to use and why they are used, and there is nothing going on in JWST that anyone feels is subpar or not the right way to go. Now, rewatching my video, I could see how I left the impression that fights occurred and in the end, someone was forced to capitulate against their better judgment. That's not how those meetings went, and I want to clarify that point. What's going on, JWST, is what everyone agrees should be going on it. Nobody is having to capitulate. So another thing that I was corrected on was that I also said in that past video that Greg Robinson, the program director for JWST at NASA HQ, testified before the House Science Committee. He didn't. What I actually was referring to was a presentation he gave to the NASA Astrophysics Advisory Committee where he talked about the state of the schedule for JWST. That was not the House Science Committee. That was my mistake. Now, if you'll recall, though, what I was referencing with those comments was the bonus give back that was pledged by Northrop Grumman if anything went wrong with the mission. NG can do what it wants with its money. The bonuses they've won are theirs. But from the government's perspective, Eric Smith told me that under extreme circumstances, the government can try to claw back some of those bonuses, but what they can't get back are costs of the mission. If they tried to get back some of the costs, then Northrop Grumman would be doing something for the government for free, which NASA cannot accept. So, let's be clear. We aren't talking about getting back costs. My understanding is that if anything happens to JWST, Northrop Grumman has said it will give back some or all of the bonuses it has received, but not the costs. So it's important to make that distinction, and Eric wanted to be sure I made that clearer. NASA cannot try to get back any of the actual costs, only the bonuses. 
I think what Northrop Grumman is trying to do is show that they have some skin in the game and, that, and to also show that they understand the importance of getting the mission right the first time, which I think was the spirit of those comments. <laughs> but Felicia said, boy, that would be awesome, and it would be great if they'd put that down on paper. And, uh, Eric was, and Eric was not able to confirm that anything had been agreed to be given back or would be given back. Uh, he, we wasn't entirely sure about that, so stay tuned on that. We'll see if they actually do it. So I'll close this video out with a summary of some comments I made to them about the anxiety level that many of you have expressed over what happens if JWST doesn't deploy or fails. I told them that there's some real emotional stress out there, among myself included, that this, this thing may not work on the first go, and what a tragedy that would be. And Eric responded by saying that it's, it's important to remember that one of the reasons this is taking so long is the testing. He said that there is no doubt that this project is bold and ambitious, but the level of testing that JWST is undergoing is equally unprecedented. There isn't a person at NASA that doesn't get it, that this has to work the first time. They get that. So they are testing like crazy. So what I want to say to you is NASA knows about our anxiety. They get it and are doing the only thing they can, which is test, 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 like crazy. Now, Eric also said that the meeting that I referenced in my last video, you know, the one about the go, no go for JWST, it was in fact held in late November and it was an internal meeting called Key Decision Point D or KDPD and it's the formal demarcation of the end of construction and the beginning of integration of testing. Now NASA never really issues press releases on KDPDs and JWST did pass it and so testing will continue. But that's not something they usually talk about with the general public. It doesn't seem interesting enough. But the next big thing will be the launch environment testing in, in the spring. And Eric said that for him, that's the next big thing in the mission because at that point, if anything falls off or has any problems, it's going to be a really big deal. So we'll watch for that in the spring coming up in 2020. So <laughs> this has been an interesting experience for me. It's been one of my first forays into actual journalism, which is something I'm obviously not trained in but I learned a lot from this experience. Now, I want to thank all of you for sticking with me all these years, and I'm really excited about 2020, and I promise I'll be a little bit more careful about all the things I say on SFN. So SFN's made possible by Deep Astronomy Patreon patrons and others who contribute through deepastronomy.com. So thank you all to all of you. I couldn't do this without you. And thanks to all of you for watching, and as always, keep looking up.